on your side tonight with Jamie Bowl starts now. And we appreciate you staying with us. We begin this half hour with the scales of justice. Think about it. How many places could you drop someone from a century ago into the modern world and they wouldn't notice much of a difference? Well, a courtroom would be one of those places. They don't look much different and they operate largely the same way they did generations ago. Right down to the case management files still on paper. That is until recently. The North Carolina court system launched a plan that would embrace modern technology. The system would go digital. It's called eCourts. The software is being used in 27 counties, including Mecklenburg. By the fall, the plan is to have e-courts in 49 of the state's 100 counties. Around here, Anson, Cabarrus, Stanley, and Union counties will be part of the final group to roll out that system. Now, on the surface, this change seems to provide several well, obvious benefits, right? you got 24-7 statewide service for judicial branch employees, attorneys, and public users. you got web-based access to court records and documents and greater case management ability. But the system has had its bugs. If you can't access your bank account online for a time, that's annoying. If you can't get up-to-date and correct court information, you mess with people's lives and maybe even put them in danger. The problems with the state's e-court system has led to a federal class action lawsuit against Tyler Technologies, the parent company of the e-court's software, and several county sheriffs, including Mecklenburg County's Gary McFadden. Attorney Zach Ezor is leading the lawsuit on behalf of clients who say they have suffered because of glitches in the computer system. It was about February that we really started to get inklings that uh, the rollout wasn't going as planned. What was jumping out to you? Well, these re-arrests on you know, what we've liked to call ghost warrants or zombie warrants, um, things that are uh, you know, outstanding after underlying charges have been resolved. But the other thing is over-detention. Um, and these were stories of people who had been detained after they had either posted bond or otherwise been ordered released um, for hours or sometimes even days. Um, and that just wasn't happening before at the scale that we've been seeing it now. And tonight, for the first time, we are hearing the stories of those impacted, the plaintiffs in this federal lawsuit. We're going to start with Kevin Spruill. He lives in Wake County. He was arrested three times on one of those ghost warrants that Ezor was just talking about. Can you start at the very beginning here, your first encounter here with, with law enforcement? This would have been in February of 2023. Uh, mm -hmm. I was pulled over. Uh, the officer was saying there was an issue with the border plate around my license plate, which was the original reason why I was stopped. Um, I then provided my license registration as requested. Uh, he returned to his vehicle and was running my information. Uh, was there for a rather lengthy amount of time before returning to my vehicle and asking me to step out of the car. Um, I then questioned what the issue was because uh, I thought it was for my plate and I would be issued a ticket at work. Yeah. Um, and then he let me know that there was a felony warrant open for my arrest. Um, I then asked him what the charges were and he let me know there was uh, obtaining property under false pretenses and that I needed to be arrested at that point in time. From there, I was arrested. I was taken down to the, the Durham County uh, Jail. Uh, I was booked, uh, but I was able to make bail and I uh, had a court appearance scheduled for the next week. Um, I did make my initial appearance there. Uh, they let me go and set another court date. Uh, prior to that next court date, I was arrested again in Zebulon, North Carolina uh, for the same charges. Um, was placed in the back of the police car. Uh, officer was telling me same charges, obtaining yeah. property under false pretenses. So the original time they arrest you, right, there's this arrest warrant, okay, then you go and you said you made your appearance, you went to the magistrate, right? And, yes. and they and then they set a bond at that point. Correct. And you uh -huh. paid it, met it, uh -huh. so you got released. So the second time, then you're pulled over. You see, you know, a police officer behind you. What are you thinking? I have no idea what it's for. This time, I had just immediately uh, was pulling through a stoplight, so there was no chance I was speeding or anything like that. Uh, so he pulled me. I had no idea what it was about. He asked me to show my hands at first, identify who I was. I told him I was Kevin Spruill. He let me know that the uh, the warrant was still open. Um, I got out of the vehicle, and again, I was handcuffed and placed in the back of a police car. And you're trying to explain. Wait, hold on. This is not right. Are they listening to you? He shows me in the system uh, on the computer in the cop car that the, the case is still open. Uh, which I'm confused about because, like you said, I already, already gone through the magistrate office and that whole process there. Um, but, again, I had the wherewithal to remember I actually taken a picture of my paperwork. 
So uh, he was kind enough to let me look through my cell phone. I was able to retrieve those pictures and present them to him. And uh, again, he talked to the officer and they were able to get everything resolved. So then you're arrested again, you said, at the courthouse itself. I was able to attend my court date the following week where I was arrested again in the courtroom. Uh, on the same charges, again, obtaining property under false pretenses. I was handcuffed and shackled this time and taken to a holding cell. Uh, but again, I had my paperwork with me. I asked the officer again, um, I have my paperwork with me on the bench uh, in the courtroom. If you're able to take a look at that, show it to the judge. Uh, they were able to review it after about an hour and a half, and I guess they got everything situated at that point. How maddening was all of this? How frightening was all of this? Mm. Um, extremely. Uh, Again, not knowing there was a felony warrant out for my arrest. Uh, again, being arrested multiple times for the same charges on that case. Uh, just an overwhelming feeling of helplessness, pretty much. Spurl maintains his innocence on that felony charge. We'll have to see where the case goes in the future. Meantime, here in Mecklenburg County, in the first four days after the launch of e-courts, approximately 66 people were jailed beyond their time of release because of technical glitches. Valerie Daniel says the issues continued. She was arrested for simple assault. That's a misdemeanor. This was on December 4th, 2023. Her release was ordered for the next day, December 5th. No conditions, no bond. But she was held longer than she should have been. December 4th, um, my actions kind of put me where I am, and there's no denying that. After my actions landed me in Mecklenburg County, I got there maybe around nine o'clock mm -hmm. uh, on the fourth and I didn't get to see the well I came before the master at around about 10 10 30 maybe mm -hmm. so I learned then that the judge wasn't there uh, on the fifth um, I came before the judge at nine o'clock in the morning and bond and all but didn't have a bond they let me go and I stayed there another night because they didn't let me go until three o'clock Wednesday morning why I have no idea <laughs> when I asked the uh, officer at the front desk uh, she informed me that uh, Mecklenburg County system wasn't matching up to the police department or something so a computer glitch yeah Describe what happened to you then um, the next day when it's, they're going to let you out. How did that whole process work? Did someone just come and say, oh, you're free? Well, I didn't sleep at all that night because um, I, my daily morning starts with a medication regimen and I didn't have my medicines. That's seven pills I take a day. And I can say they gave me one pill while I was in there, one of my blood uh, pressure medicines while I was in there gave me one pill mm. and that third day early that morning I want to say around two o'clock two o'clock maybe I started feeling the effects of not having my medicine for three days and so that's when I was talking with the um, officer that was on the floor there and um, she was trying to get someone to get me medication what happens if you don't get your medicine well for me <laughs> a number of things could happen because like, I'm asthmatic mm -hmm. and like I said I have a chronic pain condition so sleeping there was was very hard for me very hard and it just I wouldn't wish that on nobody else just how angry are you about all of this? I'm, I'm, I'm real angry about it because I feel as if if you let, if I'm in court before you at 9 o'clock in the morning, at least by 11 or 12, I should have been walking out of the door. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand that there's a process and... I, I mean, it's not that I can just go and get my things because hey, I don't know where they are. But look like if you should have had a better process. Eli Timberg is representing Valerie in the federal lawsuit. For someone like her to be spending that those extra hours, I mean, you know, some people might say it's not that long, it was an extra day. And a day is important. How much would you pay to get a, an extra day of life, you know? It's incredibly stressful to be in jail. Um, there's a lot of people dealing with mental illness in jail, and, and so your guard is just on high alert. And on top of that, Depending on your medical conditions and how old you are, you're missing medication. Um, 
you're missing really important parts of your life. And for a case that's a misdemeanor, the chances of her spending an hour in jail, of, of, even if convicted, is what? Nil? Highly unlikely. Just in general, how is this whole thing working in the court system right now here locally? Yeah, it's it's been bad. Um, there's there's the problems inside the courtroom. I, we're handling much fewer cases than we used to handle. But the thing that's really sort of unforgivable to me is the delayed release at the jail. Um, that's the part that needed to be right when we rolled it out. Getting it done right because attorney Gagan Gupta says your tax dollars are being used to fund the system. And what's sitting behind this is now $125 million of taxpayer money. Um, it started as a $100 million contract with a company called Tyler Technologies. There was a bidding process, um, but already that's ballooned by another 25%. And so I think North Carolinians in general, whether you've been caught up in the system or not, are saying, hey, what's going on? Asking questions. Um, we all want a functioning e-filing and electronic court system. It's 2024. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of companies that can do this, that have done it correct in other places. Absolutely, and our federal court system has been uh, uh, digitized for uh, years now, um, and the company sitting behind that was one of the bidders. Now, I'm not making any commentary as to who should have been selected sure. or who shouldn't, ha shouldn't have been selected, um, but once Tyler was selected, they had a duty both in contract and generally, especially with $125 million on the table, to do this right and to make sure that if there were bumps in the road that we had what we're calling fail-safe mechanisms in place um, to ensure that people wrongfully caught up in the system had an easy off-ramp out of that so that they weren't uh, robbed of their liberty unnecessarily. Our investigator reporter Naomi Coles did some digging into Tyler Technologies. This is not the first lawsuit against the company. She joins us live in studio to tell us what she's found next.